This is the Pastor Podcast with Randy and Andy. Andy Payton is the lead pastor at Methodist Temple United Methodist Church in Evansville, Indiana. Randy Moore is associate pastor at Methodist Temple. Their goal is to see Christ in everything and everyone. Okay, everyone, it's Pastor Podcast time again. I'm Randy along with Andy. And Pastor Andy, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing well. It's good to be with everyone. Um, Looking forward to Thanksgiving. Yeah, we're talking about uh, the, the, what makes our souls prosper. That's the way we always begin. And I couldn't help thinking about Thanksgiving. It's uh, we are recording on Tuesday, so we're two days ahead of Thanksgiving. And I think I'm not alone when I say Thanksgiving might be my favorite holiday. Not a religious holiday, but maybe uh, maybe it gets the point more than most, right? Yeah. I mean. It even has been run over by Christmas, by the cultural Christmas, which has already started. Um, But I really like Thanksgiving and um, the the whole idea of gratitude. And I've been thinking about that a lot, especially in terms of um, a couple of your sermons where you made the connection between psychology and spirituality. Um, And, you know, the the psychological or spiritual benefits of gratitude. Mm -hmm. If we could just really uh, be grateful, we set it aside one day a, a year for it. But wow, what a difference it would make uh, neurologically, spiritually, all psychologically, the all the way around. Yeah. Well, in Paul's writings, there's this zinger towards the end of First Thessalonians, which is what we talked about last week. Towards the end, he says, um, give thanks within all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We often wonder about like what's God's will for our lives, what's God want from us or uh, desire for us. And in that line, you have basically a pretty straightforward command of, well, give thanks within all circumstances. Now, not for, but within, there's always some sort of sign of life that we can claim. Yeah. I don't know why it is, but it's a universal thing where people just want more, and most of us have enough. Now, there are people who don't have enough, mm-hmm. and that's a major, major concern. But for those of us who have enough, why can't we be satisfied, content, great, uh, grateful for enough? Yeah. Well, it's ironic, really. We have Thanksgiving on Thursday, and we <laughs> pivot very quickly to what they call Black Friday, where yeah. everyone stands in line to shop and fill their lives back up because we're not right. grateful enough, apparently, or something. I, I don't know. It's uh, it's one of my favorite holidays, too, though. I uh, always like getting around the table with people and just being together with no other agenda, really, except for to be together and to be grateful. And I think that certainly is what God wants for us. Yeah, it's absolutely good Good for the soul. Okay, so we are, um, if you're just joining us, maybe this is the first time you've listened to the podcast. Uh, for the last many weeks now, we have been talking about Andy's sermon series on the 25 Articles of Religion. Uh, those are the 25 articles that John Wesley handed over to the church that was growing in in America. Uh, They have their origin in the 39 Articles of the Church of England, um, of which Wesley was a priest uh, till the day he died. And so we're up to Article 16, um, and Andy preached on this last week. It's about the sacraments, and this one's a little bit tricky because um, this article on sacraments is followed up by Articles on the two sacraments of the Protestant tradition, uh, Holy Communion or Eucharist or, or the Lord's Supper and, and baptism. So we don't want to, you know, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I thought what I might do because um, Andy did an Andy thing in the sermon. He talked about being sacramental without using the language, without using the word uh, sacrament. So I thought I might um, try to kind of make that connection and then slip into some of the uh, things that you said during the sermon. So, I mean, just basically, again, um, in the Protestant uh, tradition, we have two sacraments. Why don't I go ahead and just read this article first before we do that, because it'll list – we didn't read these in the, in the service because it would have taken too much time to explain what that was all about. But why don't I go ahead and read the article, and then, I won't, and then I'll uh, say what I was going to say right there. Um, sacraments ordained of Christ are not only badges or tokens of Christian men's profession, but rather they are certain signs of grace and God's good will toward us, by which he doth work invisibly in us and doth not only quicken, 
but also strengthen and confirm our faith in him. There are two sacraments ordained of Christ our Lord in the gospel. That is to say, baptism and the supper of the Lord. Those five commonly called sacraments, that is to say, confirmation, penance, orders, matrimony, and extreme unction are not to be counted for sacraments of the gospel, being such as have partly grown out of the corrupt following of the apostles and partly are states of life allowed in the scriptures, but yet have not the like nature of baptism and the Lord's Supper because they have not any visible sign or ceremony ordained of God. The sacraments were not ordained of Christ to be gazed upon or to be carried about, but that we should duly use them. And in such only as worthily receive the same, they have a wholesome effect or operation, but they that receive them unworthily purchase to themselves condemnation, as St. Paul saith. And so I think you can see right there why we didn't read the entire article Sunday, uh, because it would have taken some unpacking, and we can we have a bit more time here to do some of that unpacking, but we'll remind people that th- this is a Reformation document, really. I mean, th- this uh, Wesley actually actually did a cut and paste on this one out of the 39 articles, made no changes to it uh, whatsoever. In others, of course, w- going from 39 to 25, he-, he dropped a few, and he edited some others. But this one was just, as I said, it was a copy and paste uh, from the 39. But those 39, you know, came out of uh, the English Reformation. And so these are Reformation documents, which means they're taking a critical look at Catholicism, which we today are not quite so critical. No, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> that's why, I, that's really why I didn't read the whole thing, because right. this is one of those articles where they're going uh, over the top in mm-hmm. terms of explaining why that they are not Catholic and right. why the that our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Catholic tradition are wrong. And I don't know, that's just not a great selling point for today. And and so, but you're right, this is certainly something that's born out of the Reformation. They're defining um, what it means to be Protestant. They're pointing to the two sacraments um, of baptism and the Lord's Supper as they define them. And uh, the way that at least we understand the sacraments in the Protestant tradition. And it even goes into naming the so-called sacraments in the Roman Catholic tradition. But uh, I would even put it all a step farther and just say, I believe all of life can be sacramental. The sacraments are be- are there to really point us to the sacramental nature of all of life, which how do you list all the sacramental places in which you find God's life speaking through us or, or to us and all those kinds of things? I know that's a broad subject, but yeah. Um, so, well, thank you so much because you're leading me in, setting me up to set you up for what you said in the sermon. Because that's exactly where I was going to go. So, what is a what is a sacrament? Well, uh, God takes ordinary things like water, like bread, like wine, like juice, like olive oil and does something extraordinary with it. And so it's the mixture of the material and the spiritual. It's even in the creation. God in creation took the material and the spiritual and created the universe. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself, the word made flesh, something spiritual made material. Um, So, you know, so we see in the in the wine of uh, in, in the wine or the juice of uh, in the bread of holy communion, simple elements that really carry the real presence. Right? Another we could get into that other argument about transubstantiation in the Catholic Church. While we don't go that far, we somehow say Christ is present in that for us. There's there's the real there's the real presence. Uh, baptism, water, such a simple element, but it's it's material. But by the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, it mixes together. And so then I would say, which you just said, where do we stop then in identifying what it is that God infuses with the Spirit? Does he not infuse everything? Yeah. I mean, my simple answer to that would be like, where else did we come from? If God would remove God's presence from us, then we would cease to exist, essentially. And so the creator of the universe who is 
currently creating the world in which we live in, of course, is going to speak to us, interact with us, make God's presence known to us through the created things of the world. Mm -hmm. And the water baptism and the bread and the wine of communion certainly point in that direction, but it's meant to be a, a, an invitation to a, a broader way of looking at our lives. And so if you just stop at the sacrament itself and it doesn't enter you into a new sense of dialogue with life and God, you've really not received the sacrament yet. I mean, I'm not trying to be judgmental here, but you've kind of missed the point. So God's presence, technically speaking, is always with us, always. And what the sacraments do, though, it's kind of like a radio. You tune in to that presence with those sacraments. You tune into it. It's always there, sure, but when we receive the bap baptism, receive baptism, or receive communion, what we're doing is we're, we're tuning into that love that's already there. And so as we receive the sacraments through faith, yes, we become vividly aware of God's presence in that moment. There's a real presence in it. And this can kind of sound magical or mysterious to people, but really it's not. It's, it's just saying, look, let's tune back into the place we came from and the place we're going. And, and we're going to use like physical elements to do that. And it's beautiful. Think about how beautiful that is for a moment. Like, I think we think, I think we think as people, we have to think up God, right? We have to get it all figured out. No. In the sacraments, we're tasting and they're touching our way to the holy. And anyone's welcome to experience that. Even a child can come experience that. And it's just, I don't know, it's central to what it means to be a Christian and to take incarnation seriously. Well, sometimes, not always, um, when I serve communion, I will say something like this. I'll say, you know, I'm going to say these words over these elements, and they're important words, and they, they go back, you know, a long way. And the church has been using those words for a long, a long, long time. But sometimes I'll just add, you know what, I don't know how I, I don't know how there's anything that I could do that would make these elements more blessed than they already are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, like I say, you know, a meal, when you go home and, and you have a meal today, maybe it's not a sacrament, but it's sacramental. Mm -hmm. the, the, the food that you eat, the food that you eat every day, right. we're back to gratitude we, now. We pray over it. We pray <laughs> over the food. Like, how can that not be sacred? Like, right. you, let's stop and let's pray. Why? It's sacred. And, yeah. This is a sacred moment. This is in, in a very real sense, and I don't think we've been taught to think of it this way, but in a very real sense, in that food, God's giving God's self to you to sustain your life in that moment. Presence. It's presence. And I think that's where you were going with your sermon. You didn't use the word sacrament, but you were talking about the presence of God. I technically used the word sacrament. And ritual once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> someone someone went out of their way to come to me yesterday and say and said, Well, your sermon didn't have anything to use to do with sacraments. And I said, Yeah, I did I use the word sacrament and ritual? <laughs> um, but I was trying to focus on the bigger picture because as you said, we have a couple other uh sacramental articles of religion coming up and well, I didn't want to talk about it all in one sermon, you know. But anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I think that's been the real gift of of this sermon series, and I've said it before, and um, you know that um, you, you've put uh, some of these terms, which can be confusing to people. Some people have never heard of them, and they can just get like lost in in all of that. And you try to uh, tr try to explain these things um, in in a way that people can understand them. And, I, and for me, the connection was was the presence. And we'll get to that. The, the, um, the outside in and the inside out kind of a thing, uh, that we'll, that we'll talk about. So let's, um, let's do that. Let's jump in and uh, talk about your sermon on Sunday. And I'll say real quickly that you don't have to have been here to hear Pastor Andy's sermon. You didn't have to have heard it on, on, on um, virtual worship. Um, we think that what we say here today, uh, will be beneficial on its own. But what we do is we sort of dig a little deeper in, into the sermon. And you started off uh, talking about when you were appointed um, senior pastor here, lead pastor here, after having been associate pastor in your first lunch <laughs> or coffee. What was it? It was a lunch. and <laughs> Yeah. And uh, it was going well. In my story, I, I told Sunday it was going well. 
And I kind of had a sneaky suspicion there was another agenda to the lunch and and this person who's a fine, good person um, uh, basically asked me the question, what are you going to do? What's your vision for the church? And the funny thing about that question is what it did to me. Um, immediately, I went into what I call doing mode, and I began to give a to-do list of the things I hope to do as a lead pastor. Um, but that was seven years ago, and a lot's happened between that moment and today. And today, if I was asked that question, I would just probably say something like, well, it doesn't matter what I want. It's what God wants. And what God wants more than anything else is basically that the world would understand and realize and experience that God loves them and God cares for them. And that's the purpose of the church. And that's the purpose of the sacraments. And about anything we else we do as Christians, that's the purpose. We're just basically trying to live our lives and worship in such a way that we're tuning into that love that's always there, that care that's always there. Um, and as I said to you a couple different times last week, this is basically the only sermon I want to preach because <laughs> it's the one that matters the most, is to, is to experience God in such a way that we realize that God is, um, I'll use the word benevolent. And as we experience that benevolence, we also begin to see the world in our lives through that lens as well. I can think of no bigger challenge, no bigger mission or purpose for what it means to be Christian and be a part of the church. Why do you think it is that some people and maybe most people don't believe that God uh, loves them? Do you think it's um, because of some of the passages in the Bible that per, that depict God as an, as an angry or a violent God? Or is it because Christians haven't been very loving? Or some some combination of the two, or what is it? I think it's some it's well, that's complicated. Yeah. My answer would be it's complicated. Yes, they have been taught some of the things from the scriptures that are less than loving. And yes, um, they've been taught uh, through experiences with the church um, that God could be less than loving. But I, I would even take it, I guess, a step further. I think the reason why people struggle so much with trusting that God actually loves them is they have, we, always, we all have struggles with loving ourselves. The great enemy of the spiritual quest is self-rejection. And what those outside negative voices do, basically, is confirm that inner voice of self-rejection. And so that's why it's so hard to convince people that God loves them. I mean, yeah, they're, everyone will nod like, yeah, yeah, God loves, God loves me. But then to really experience that, we have to get over our own self-rejection too. And and, and allow it to, I mean, how do I explain this here? When we become convinced that God loves us, what inevitably begins to happen is we feel at home in this world and in this life. And let's be honest, a lot of us don't feel home. Mm -hmm. We feel like we don't measure up. We're so critical over ourselves. And uh, when someone says something negative to us, it confirms all those voices and so really, when you're when I'm saying, hey, God loves you, God cares for you, it's a lifelong process to actually instill that voice into us. Yeah. How can God love me when I'm so unlovable? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and one of the funny, we were just talking before our podcast today about silence and how people struggle with silence. I think one of the reasons people struggle with silence is because when we become silent, we have to hear ourselves. We have to hear it. And hearing ourselves is not always easy. There's a lot going on within us. We come terms to terms with those negative voices, sinful voices, voices that are less than loving. And so I think in our world today, when during a worship service or something, say, hey, let's take a moment of silence, people get uncomfortable. Well, they're hearing the chatter in that moment. And so when we're trying to say, hey, God loves you, God cares for you, what we're trying to say is, hey, even beyond those voices, there's another voice and, and tune into that voice. And that's what we're trying to do here. And when we tune into the voice, back to just what I said, we feel at home. Yeah. Yeah. All right. In your sermon, you structured it this way. You took the simple phrase, God loves you, and you broke it down into three parts. God loves you. God. <laughs> it's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> um there's as many interpretations as there are interpreters for what we're talking about when we talk about God. Um, 
And I think, quite honestly, there's more than one right answer when it comes to the sacred dimension and the spiritual dimension of our lives. Um, everyone's a little different. Therefore, everyone's experience with God's a little different. But in my sermon, the way I differentiated it is like there's two big camps when it comes to God. There's the God of the outside in and there's the God of the inside out. In the last few hundred years, we've been trained to think of God as the outside in. And what I mean by that is as a result of the scientific revolution, which has done wonderful things for technology and all sorts of stuff that we have today, one of the shadow effects of that gift has been um, we have been taught to think about this world as a natural process that is separate from the sacred and God. And so inevitably what happens is we begin to relate to God from the outside in. God is on st standing on the outside of our lives in this world looking in. And just stop and think about how that affects one's prayer life and relationship with God and really relationship with life. You know, hey, God, come over here and help me. Come over here and speak to me. Come over here and save me. And what can eventually happen is people begin to just wrestle with their faith in God. They begin to think, none of this really matters. I've prayed and it didn't happen. I listened for a voice and didn't speak. I'm all alone, so this is a waste of time. That's one of the great tragedies of the Western worldview that we live in and the Western world that we live in right now is we've been trained to just see it all through that, I'll call it materialistic lens. And that's the God of the inside, outside in. Um, the God of the inside out is really a, kind of a return to the way the ancients saw the world. And in many ways is a return to what science is beginning to see of the world. I'll add that too. And the God of the inside out says, no, 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 it's not just materialistic. There's a spiritual dimension to our lives. The sacred dimension is here. It's now, it's working from the inside out. In fact, that's why Jesus, I believe, was overall sent. Jesus was sent to teach us about the name of the God that Jesus teaches us about is Emmanuel, God with us. God is in the midst of the muck and the mire of our lives, working through the processes of our lives. Um, I guess to use an analogy of the God inside, of the God of the inside out would be the story of Brother Lawrence. I, I'm sure, I mean, Randy, yeah. I know, you, you know who that Practicing is. Practicing the presence of God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. famous book. Yeah. Um, his, the story goes of him. Uh, his conversion experience happened when he was standing and looking at a tree one winter, and he realized that tree's gonna bloom again. There's going to be life that springs out from that tree, from the inside out. And, and that changed him. His name became Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection as a result of that moment. That's the God of the inside out. That's the God of Christianity. And it's just a tragedy that we have trained ourselves to think of our lives other than that. I, I could go on and on about this because <laughs> I... I mean, I, I mean, I've said it to you before, Randy. It's like, that's that's the mission. That's the mission. You think, we think we're all alone. We're not all alone. We think it's all about us. It's not all about us. We are interconnected. We are part of a greater life. It's sacred. It's benevolent. It's guiding us. It's loving us. All of those things here and now. And we're just trying to convince people of it. Pretty good definition of God. All right, we're working on the phrase, God loves you. That's God. And uh, the next word we want to delve into is loves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus, God loves like Jesus. And as Christians, that's what we believe. Um, and in the sermon, I differentiated between, we can debate a lot about the things Jesus taught. And just to be upfront and candid, some of the things he taught throughout the Gospels sometimes feel like they contradict one another. And we have four different accounts of Jesus's life. And in some ways, we have four different accounts of his teachings. And so there's like a lot of debate there. But the one thing we, I think, universally can all agree upon is all the things that he did. And in what he did, the person that he was, the actions that he took, here we find a picture of how God loves us from the inside out. Um, and the sermon I talked about, he healed people. He um, developed friendships and relationships with people. He 
multiplied food for people. Uh, he at some at times did turn over some tables, and those tables to me represented oppression, death-dealing ways that the world had kind of got co-opted and, and possessed by death, death-dealing practices. And so he turned over some of the tables that represented those kinds of practices. And then ultimately, though, the big thing Jesus did, of course, is he died. And it's not what he did do. It's kind of what he didn't do. He, he allowed himself to be handed over. And he didn't say a whole lot. He just kind of like let it happen. And I think in that moment of him dying, we really do get a picture about how God works in our lives and and how God continues to work in our lives. And so Jesus, of course, dies and he is risen again from the dead. And what we find in that moment is a lens through which we can see our own lives, kind of like the tree of Brother Lawrence. We we see that God is constantly calling out new life in the midst of our lives. And back to gratitude and the spiritual quest again, a spiritual posture, a faithful posture if this is the lens through which we're seeing our lives in the world, is really about how do I find and claim those signs of life and trust those signs of life I've been given? And that's really what makes a healthy person, right? A healthy person is a person that's adapting and changing and evolving. And in a real sense, they're they're okay with rolling with the punches. Now, that doesn't mean we just kind of lay over and let people run us over. No, Um, God does not want death for us, right? That's not the point. Um, but to adapt is being willing to change, though. When life throws you a curveball, you you go with it because you know that you're part of that greater life that's calling out life. And there's going to be new doors open. There's going to be a new path open for us. And And I think more than anything else, if we could understand ourselves as a part of a, a bigger mystery that's leading us in that way, we get a sense of how God loves us. You made me think about my grief share group, and uh, one of the things we talk about there is because we're all dealing with a big death, you know, but we all die to all sorts of things all, all the time. So it's not like we're not familiar with death. Like I'm no longer a child. I've I've been you aren't either. You're, you know, you'll never be a child again. Uh, you died to that, and you had to adapt to that. I'm no longer a teenager. That that. That's gone, you know, just mm-hmm. to think about the the aging process, all sorts of we experience death all sorts of ways, and we we rise from those mm-hmm. in all sorts of ways. So we have practice along the way. It's more than practice, it's a real thing. Yeah, it's the rhythm of life. Yeah. yeah. and and our response, though, it's it's kind of in our court. The choice is ours, right? Um, You have seen this in people. I've seen this in people. I've seen it in my own self, too. And I'm sure you probably would admit, Randy, you've seen it in yourself, too. We become bitter or better based upon our capacity to claim those signs of life. And uh, and bitterness begins to settle in for a person when they um, get to a place where it feels like a dead end, but they won't and they won't pivot. Mm -hmm. I had a professor in seminary who said that most of the angst in the world is the result of people not grieving well. They're not letting it go. Mm-hmm. They're trying to enact a plan, enact a way of life. They're holding on to a person, and they're not letting themselves let it go. And just think about what that feels like. You're trying to do something that's impossible. Gosh, that's a heavy burden. I think maybe you've slipped into the third segment here we've been talking about and breaking down this phrase, God loves you, we've dealt with God and loves, and I think we've entered into into you now because you're talking about what happens when you uh, picture God from the outside in, and we're, and that's where that anger comes from and that greed uh, comes from. And then you told the Chip story, which I think uh, I think you should tell tell now because you've uh, Chip is clearly a big part of your life because you've brought Chip up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so Chip's my dog, yeah. Um, he uh, he was born in April, and we bought him in the middle of all the grief and loss that was happening in our life at that time. Yeah. Um, we lost our golden retriever in January, and then uh, we bought Chip. We got Chip in June, and my dad was very sick at that time, and 
I don't know. I've kind of second guessed myself different points thinking, was that the best thing to bring in a puppy in the mix of all this? But he really, in so many ways, helped us. Um, But Chip's favorite pastime is he will uh, chew on things that aren't necessarily toys. And number two, he will bark at his reflection in our sliding glass door. When it gets dark at night, you know how you can kind of see your reflection and he'll, he'll see his reflection and begin to bark at it. And then He'll keep barking, so I have to get out of the chair, let him outside. He'll go outside, and of course, nothing's there. He'll look around, like, where's the intruder? It's not there. <laughs> Come back home. And that repeats itself over and over again some nights. But at first, of course, I got annoyed by it all. But then, <laughs> but then one day I was like, well, why does he do that? And, of course, he's a dog. But the bigger point is he has no idea who he is. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know what he looks like. Right. And that's, uh, I think, the problem with humanity in a lot of ways. Um, we've lost a sense of the sacred connection in our lives. We we don't see the world with meaning. We don't see the world through the lens of benevolence or faith anymore. And we're basically left to bark at our reflections. Internally, we're angry because we've kind of lost a sense of that bigger connection. And we project that out to the world around us. And we blame people for our problems. We blame people for our issues. We we start barking at the world. And so I would suggest that maybe the the biggest sign that someone has been converted, truly converted, is they stop barking at the world. Stop it. They don't see the people through the lens of judgment or anger or greed. They don't, they don't love people in a needy way anymore. Um, They just simply love. And why do they simply love? Because they've got to that place where they realize that, hey, God already loves me. And the sign of a person who's been loved well is they begin to want to love others. It's just about that simple. But it's not that simple. It's complicated. Very, very complicated. And all you have to do is ask a person, well, who are you? And you'll get why it's complicated, right? You know, we'll tell people we are what we do and what we have, what people say about us. We we define ourselves from the outside in and the spiritual journey begins from the finding God on the inside out. And now we've kind of switched into the mystical waters of the uh, Christian faith, but I'm convinced if Christianity is going to be relevant in the years ahead, we have to have the courage as pastors to begin to talk about our faith in an experiential way in this way, because that's the missing component We have all this head knowledge nowadays. You know, we can sit around and talk about the sacraments and the different approaches to the sacraments and the different language we use for the sacrament. We can argue until the cows come home (laughs) about that stuff, but never have never tasted or touched or experienced the holy. And what people are hungry for is to experience the holy and finding ways to describe the experience of the inside out God experience of the holy in our lives. That's the mission. That's, that's the challenge. And that's not outside Methodism or Wesleyanism. In fact, that's exactly what John Wesley preached. The yeah. religion of the heart. Yeah. Go, go read some of the sermons. Yeah. Uh, the witness of the spirit. He, yeah. he preaches multiple sermons on what he calls the witness of the spirit, the assurance of faith. Um, it goes on and on. My heart was strangely warmed. That was his language, not mine. That's his language. Um, and I grew up in a Methodist church that talked about that stuff and defined that stuff. But gosh darn, like, how do you experience it? That's the question, right? How do we get there? Um, I'm not perfect in the way I describe it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I know that uh, that's where it's at. That That's where it's at. And I saw an example would be I, I saw it the other day in a person who who just come came, she came running up to me. I was at an event and this person came running up to me and she says, I have to talk to you. I'm like, well, well, why, why, why do you want to talk to me? And she told this story about how she got lost in in this big national forest, and it was like acres upon acres, and there was no way out. And she prayed. And then you could just see it on her face as she says, Something happened. Yeah. Something happened. And she kind of was gauging how I would respond to that. And I looked at her and I said, well, that's how the ancients basically did it. I mean, Jesus went out to the wilderness to pray forever. And then he found God there and he came back out 
sharing that experience with others. And that's that's what we have to find our way back to as a people of faith today. How do we get back to that? How do we find our way there? Mm-hmm. It's multiple ways, of course, but uh, the bigger point of it all is to, I don't know, find find that sense that that I'm a part of that bigger life. Back to that idea again, we're part of this bigger life in, in, in an experiential type of way where we believe in it, where we believe in it. There it is. That's a pretty good definition of the sacrament, if you ask me. God loves you and and God is with you. Uh, just as we believe that Jesus is really present somehow in the wine and in, in the bread. Yeah, that's good. Okay, now this Sunday, uh, Pastor Andy, Article 17. Can you believe that? Did you ever think we'd get this close to 25? Article uh, 17. Now uh, the articles break down these two uh, sacraments in our tradition. And the first one will be baptism. And it says here that uh, baptism is not only a sign or profession and mark of difference whereby Christians are distinguished from others that are not baptized, but it is also a sign of regeneration or the new birth. The baptism of young children is to be retained in the church. Wow, this one is short, but that, that one says a lot there even in that last line. The baptism of young children is to be retained in the church where you might have expected him to say, we shall no longer baptize infants. We will only baptize confessing believers, right? So he's siding he's siding with the Catholic Church on, on this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wesley, if you read Wesley's Theology of the Sacraments, uh, he definitely holds to uh, a high sacramental view. And we'll, I'll get into that a little bit with the sermon, but absolutely. Um he believed that the sacraments were much more than just some sort of symbol or memorial of something that happened in the past. They were a channel to God's presence. And, and I think that basic idea is conveyed in the baptism of children. Like, we want that child to experience God's presence. Therefore, we're not going to deny them the opportunity to experience baptism or um, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, in the Methodist tradition, we even to this day hold to a we call open table policy when it comes to Holy Communion. But we also have a an open baptism policy as well. If you look in the official documents of the United Methodist Church, uh, there's a line in our official document where it says like, uh, "There is no reason why we should not allow a person to be baptized." There's really no reason. If a person wants to be baptized, they want their child to be baptized. There's no reason why we shouldn't do that. I, I just that's a pretty bold <laughs> statement. Um, I mean, I've heard people having reasons not to do it as well. But anyway, yeah. um, when I talk about what I'm going to talk about Sunday with baptism, though, is um, what is baptism? What's the biblical story of baptism? How do we get to the place we are at today? What's some of the Traditions, what's the traditions of Christianity teach us about baptism and how the big point is how does it have some sort of effect on our lives? And my overall point is going to be really what baptism does is it connects us to a bigger story. Um, from a faith perspective, it, we intersect with a bigger story that goes all the way back to the very beginning. And uh, in a very real way, it's an invitation to overcome boredom. And I'll get more into <laughs> what I mean by that in my sermon. But yeah, it, that's what it is. All right. And you'll probably use the word baptism uh, in this sermon more than once. I'm going to be so tired <laughs> of using the word baptism <laughs> when I'm done with this sermon. But uh, hopefully people will have a sense of uh, what what it means and how it, it, uh, it not only points, but uh, it helps us to enter into that experience. Very good. It. We are two days away from Thanksgiving, so we should say happy Thanksgiving. Maybe you're going to hear this before Thanksgiving. Maybe you'll hear it on Thanksgiving Day. Maybe you'll hear it after Thanksgiving Day. But the message of Thanksgiving, while this is not a religious holiday, the message of Thanksgiving is one that we need to hear. And the gratitude that we, that we, the Thanksgiving that we give on Thanksgiving is something that is very Christian, whether it's a Christian holiday or not. So I just want to say to everyone, happy Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. And I'd echo that. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. And I'll say as well, keep it sacred, people. Keep it yeah. sacred. 
All right. Very good. Thank you for listening. Have a great week. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time. This has been the Pastor Podcast with Randy and Andy. You are welcome to join us at Methodist Temple in person or online. Methodist Temple is at 2109 Lincoln Avenue in Evansville, Indiana. Our traditional Sunday morning worship service is at 830 with our contemporary service at 11. Log on to our website at methodisttemple.church. We see Christ in you.